Welcome to Roll for Crit, the official podcast for the online board game website, RollForCrit.com. Watch, shop, play. My name is Jonathan Estes. And I'm Will Keeler. We're so glad you're joining us on this whole new year, yep. and that you're uh, staying inside if you're in America during the horrific cold, yes. just like we are. And if it, you're in Hawaii, you have possible bomb shelters <laughs> that you may or may not be able to go into. Keep them stocked with board games just in case. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a while since we've done just a regular podcast. We're starting fresh in the new year. Only 2018 news. We got a bunch of cool stuff to catch up on. Before we get into it, uh, we do want to make kind of we're making a sub announcement. Yes. Uh, you will find around the same time as this video on our channel is going to be another video with a little announcement spiel about the state of our website and our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Some things relating to our store, which is a whole other side. But for you podcast watchers, basically we're changing up the format of things. Uh, starting in February. Uh, it's going to be a very different type of type of viewing experience, but not that different. You're still going to get the same kind of content that we're doing now: Kickstarter picks, mm -hmm. news updates, board game reviews. Uh, but our ugly mugs. Our ugly mugs, <laughs> presented in a little bit of a different way. The basically the long form podcast that we're doing right now is going to not be there anymore, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, at least at least for the time being. Uh, so that's what's going to happen. We're going to, but it, in in exchange for that, we're going to be having more frequent updates, new kinds mm -hmm. of videos. So you guys have suggestions of the kind of stuff you would like to see us do. Definitely leave that. But uh, so we're gonna. This is. I think we're gonna have three more, including this one, kind of regular traditional podcasts like this. So uh, we should mention that it. some of our other videos, such as the playback and uh, review, uh, how to play videos will also get some changes as well. Yeah, the whole, everything is getting kind of a facelift. We're really, in 2018, revamping ourselves, polishing some things off. I think you're going to like Just a lot before of the, the nuclear war starts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're, we were trying to get it in there before that happens. Uh, after that, eh, who knows. So, look forward to that or be afraid, but don't. It's going to be great, I promise. Now, but uh, moving on to dystopias. Yes, that's right. So many great dystopias to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not least of which relates to our favorite board game of the year 2016, mm -hmm. which was Scythe. Uh, they have announced the final Scythe expansion that is going to be released uh, sometime later this year. I believe they said Q3 of 2018. And that is called The Rise of Fenris. And that's because, you know, board game companies are always on point whenever they say a date. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Def Q3. It's about the most specific you'll ever find from a board game company. Scythe, if you don't know, very popular uh, uh, strategy game uh, where you're, you're, you got mechs, you're trying to get points, you're yeah. fighting each other, you're We've getting territory. We've talked about before, really great job art, uh, both artistically and actually just the mechanics behind it. There's a reason why it's a lot of people's number one for... For sure. Uh, so what this uh, expansion is introducing is pretty cool because it's actually coming with a campaign mode. So it's going to have eight scenarios... Yeah, basically, I shouldn't say scenarios, eight games that you're going to play that are going to make up a full campaign. And while they do promise that it's going to include surprises and new things along the way, it will be a replayable campaign. So it's not legacy. Uh, you'll be able to go back and do it again if you like. And it's also going to come with some other modular scenarios that if you like, you can add in addition to just the regular game mix in and out if there's maybe just aspects of that that you enjoy. Uh, so that's a pretty cool thing, uh, especially for people who love this game. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think it'll be really unique to have a, a campaign. It seems like every game now, that's kind of the thing, is that everybody wants that campaign experience. Well, I mean... What do you think about that? I feel like... I feel I want to say we've beaten this this horse to death, <laughs> probably. But, but like, it's a new year. <laughs> Let's beat it again. All right. Uh, the single like the single player aspect, I think, used to be owned by the video game market, and I don't think we're seeing that a lot now. Like a lot of the AAA games have either a they're just like EA says no one wants single player games, which we know is false because the mm -hmm. the top ten video games that most people list were single, but like a lot of those AAA games people expected aren't there. They're not delivering. Well, you're and, you're saying single player. This this campaign, I don't know if it's. Uh, but the campaign usually allows for a single player aspect. Th it usually does. I actually don't know. Uh, this I believe I'm pretty sure this does also. But because Scythe is a 
multiplayer. Too, it may yes. be more tuned because it's not cooperative. It may be more tuned to the. Well, that would be different then. Because yeah. most usually when you hear campaign, you usually think like cooperative, just we're going through this together. Right, or like a descent one like, of y'all. Yeah, that's usually that's the only time I was trying to think of when there's a competitive campaign. Yeah, no, this is it's uh, either that or um when risk a, a, risk, a legacy, a legacy game. game. Yeah, I'm glad they're not going legacy because I really feel. If you just throw on Legacy, it's not that cool. It's, I mean, I feel like it just feels very gimmicky. If you really build it from scratch as Legacy, then it's interesting. And because Scythe was built before mm -hmm. as a regular game, I don't think they should throw Legacy on there. I agree. I think at this point, Legacy is it's starting to feel like, okay, we're kind of hitting critical mass on that. Like right. Maybe step back a little bit. I, I like that they're not going for that. And people want to be able to replay if possible, et cetera. Uh, but I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, we, I don't think... I mean, the setting is fantastic. Yeah, Everyone, oh yeah. As, as we said in the beginning, we love Dystopian. Yeah, I, I, we, we haven't experienced either of the other expansions, uh, unless you have, and I don't know. Uh, no. So this is the final one of those. And you could also have different components if you have. You can play with more or less players if you have one of those expansions. I think they said up to seven or eight, possibly, for the campaign if you have the expansion. So... Cool. Look forward to that. Everybody likes mm -hmm. Scythe. That's very exciting. All right. So that's the Scythe news. Mm -hmm. There is more in terms of brand new game announcements that oh, are coming yeah. out. Let's talk about one of our favorite genres, deck builders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Stoneblade Entertainment. These are the guys behind Ascension. Right. And I, which I would say, next to Dominion, is pretty much like the game that kind of paved the way for deck builders. Like, I feel like so many other deck builders took that format with the, like, one lineup that you can take from and have kind of built on that. And there's, like, a million expansions for it. They have finally announced a brand new deck building game, totally unrelated. Uh, it's called Shards of Infinity. They're really going to try off a whole new branch, something they've never done before. <laughs> That's right. A whole new world of a deck builder. Uh, not related to Marvel or the Avengers in any way. Uh, they promise that this game will be, quote, faster, more strategic, and more streamlined than any deck building game on the market. Here's how they're approaching that. Here's how they, they think they're going to manage to do that. I think those are some pretty big words, considering how a turn of the DC deck building game can, you can be like... Done. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's, they're already pretty streamlined. <laughs> your turn is done before you even start it now. <laughs> yeah, that does happen a lot. Well, so it's going to have your basic center lineup, one row of cards mm -hmm. you can buy from. Uh, one of the things that's no longer going to have uh, the cultists, for instance, there's not going to be any extra constant deck piles. Just one lineup. In this game, you're, everybody's actually going to have health. So sort of like Star Realms, one of the ways you can win is by attacking your opponents. Mm -hmm. The other way you can win is you're going to have something called mastery points that you can accumulate turn by turn. When you hit a certain amount, you can win the game. What's very interesting about these mastery points that they didn't fully explain yet is they said that the more you have, the stronger the cards in your deck will be. So I'm assuming something will say like, this is worth one attack or whatever currency it is per mastery point you have. And what that means is weaker cards in your deck actually later in the game won't be worthless. And you won't have to, you know, most deck builders, a big aspect is getting rid of your deadweight cards. So I think that's a pretty cool p potential new mechanic. Another thing is there's uh, something called mercenary cards, which will come out in the lineup, but you can choose to play them immediately uh, by buying them, but you don't put them in your deck. So... It, that's one something else. Use, one time use doesn't water your deck down, uh, but you don't get it for later. So it's a, sort of a give and take. So a few different things. The other thing is it's only going to be twenty bucks, twenty dollar deck building game, which is pretty cheap for 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 a card game. So a lot of things in there sound cool, but the question is, will it be enough to really stand out from the crowd of deck builders? You know? Yeah. I mean, this is the problem. One, their other game is a big deck builder, which means a lot of people have it. The cheap price has help. However, it's not a market that doesn't exist. You literally mentioned Star Realms, another cheap deck builder. Mm -hmm. Very cheap. But it does exist. And then you have to consider that two of the biggest properties right now, DC and Marvel, have deck builders. There's also the fact that they're competing with themselves, essentially. Like, right. They have one of the biggest deck builders now, out there. And now, I am fine usually buying another deck builder because I, I do enjoy that mechanic. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of those things It's sort of like... A, I want, like a comfort game, I guess, would be the title because you know usually how to play it yeah. before you even open it. <laughs> and 
I do. I for me, I do like how there's in some other ones. There's cards that I like. Okay, this isn't good now, but in late game, this is really good. Or early game, this is going to be good, but then it's weaker, so then I'll need to get rid of it. So maybe building around the master points, was it called? Mastery. Mechan yeah. uh, mastery mechanic might help and make things interesting. I, I mean, we'll have to yeah. see. Uh, and it does depend because I always feel uh, any game that has attacking other people and knocking them out is definitely curious to see, especially in a deck builder because, I mean, we've had this happen every deck building game we played. I, I do not think this is immune to deck building games, but it's so easy for one person to snowball. And if snowballing might be the attacking route, it sort of just stinks if you're like, well, Jonathan just got the car that lets him attack everyone every turn. Yeah, the attacking thing is definitely. I, I'm in I the mean, same Star Road made it through, but like, it's it's definitely something to, to see. My my issue with it, and same thing in Star Realms actually, is something we see in a, I feel like a bunch of these card games, uh, even non deck builders like we've talked about with Versus or uh, Ashes, when you are just hitting people for health points. Some there there's always comes the time when you're like. You have to just decide which person you want to make mad. Do you know what I mean? Uh, there, there's often not really a great reason to attack one person over another, except, well, they're in the lead, so go for them. Or now they're in the lead, so go for them. Which, to me, isn't that interesting of a strategic choice. It's just their points are higher. Which, I admit, maybe you could boil it down to almost every game. That's a larger discussion. Uh, but I definitely am more excited. The mastery thing sounded really interesting no, to me. No, that's definitely the most interesting. I want to see. That's going to help me that that's how it's going to stand out i think yeah. compared to the rest and once again it's only twenty dollars so relatively speaking like sure star owns cheaper and of course I, I guess this technically i sort of mentioned this but i do i'm curious on the theme like yeah in the art that's another thing i'll be uh, even just the from the log line of you know you're like trying you get the control these power shards of infinity which are basically infinity shards from marvel <laughs> it sounds like it's not super, it just sounds kind of like a cool fantasy theme, but nothing original. Speaking really. of which, side note, uh, Upper Deck. Yeah. Can we get a new legendary set that brings back and uses the shards? Because those were fun. Yeah, Upper Deck. Anyway, so Shards of Infinity will be coming out. I, I don't know if they set a date, probably 2018. I always like the beginning of the year because it's just safe to assume it'll come mm -hmm. out in this year. Uh, and we'll see how it does. If anybody can market a new deck building game, these guys have some experience in that, in that field for sure. Uh, shooting off of uh, <laughs> deck building games, let's go to LCGs. Oh, yes. I've heard there's some rumblings in the world of Arkham Horror. Oh, there are. What's these well, rumblings? <laughs> as you know, that you've played through the first season, the uh, Night of the Zealot. That's right. Of the, the That's one of the campaigns that they it call it. It is the first campaign of Arkham Horror. With all the, the ghouls from the core set. Uh, we're currently playing through. It's fun to just try to get everyone together, of course. Yeah. Uh, the the, uh, the Dunwich campaign. I can't remember the official yeah, name the of Dunwich it. The Dunwich Legacy. Legacy of, Legacy of Dunwich, I believe. But what they've just announced is the return to the Night of the Zealot. What this is, is do you remember the Nightmare decks from Lord of the Rings? I do remember those. It's, they they made the game harder. <laughs> right. It, that's what it does. It's a lot like that. Except what they're doing here, instead of, it seems to be, this is just for the core. So I'm hoping this falls through for all the rest. But this comes with an entire box for the entire set. You don't buy them for each scenario. With not only more difficult cards, like, instead of just finding regular ghouls, you're finding ghouls from, like, uh, the underground. Like, they're much harder, and the cultists are different. One cultist is your neighbor, and he's going to constantly keep bugging you and asking you for information, so you have to keep <laughs> trying not to give him too much information. Those pesky cultists. But you're also going to get stronger cards. So, like, there's going to be an upgraded version of the rabbit's foot, they said, and other things. It's going to come with a really nice box. You can actually see behind it. That will fit the entire scenario with dividers. So this is unlike those little plastic packs for the nightmare sets that just feel like we're quickly throwing these out. Yeah. This feels like I will not have, this is my nice box for the Zealot one. I'll have one, I'm hoping they do one for the Dunwich, one for like, so you'll just have these beautiful box, these boxes to pull out for each scenario. Yeah, I love that. The idea of the boxes is super nice and convenient. With dividers, by the way, in there. Because that's always a problem with these LCGs is storage space. Those bo The boxes that come in just aren't meant to fit. And unlike some game. of the more competitive ones where like it's a little bit harder because it's just sets grow, this, you know how much is in the Zealot. It's, this is how much we fit. Right. And then having them, because you only play one scenario at a time, you can just pull. I'm pulling out the Dunnage set, or I'm playing this set. So you don't have to have them all in one box. And it's a great idea to be able to revisit these campaigns. But it sounded like, because I read a little bit, it sounded like 
yeah, it's going to be more challenging, but also it's just going to kind of be a different experience. So right. It's, it's not it's, strictly hard mode. It's also no. There actually will be different changes. For example, uh, not too much of a spoiler because this is literally the first five lines of the scenario. What happens is you're in your room, and then the door disappears, and you're trying to find the door. However, in this one, instead of the door, there's a portal. So that not everything's going to be like, oh, it's just this, except I need higher numbers. There will be some new twists and turns. Right, right. Which is very nice. Very it, nice. Of course, perfectly makes sense for the Cthulhu world. But yeah, definitely, I think this is a smart move for this thing. Instead of the small packs, it gives a storage. Uh, it gives new cards for both the player and the, the enemies, so both sides get stronger. Uh, the, the, it's going to look fantastic and a lot easier to just buy one thing instead of a bunch of little packs. Yeah, yeah. I've got... Um so do they, I don't know if they announced the date exactly for this yet, but again, 2018. I, yeah, <laughs> I believe it was, I want to say Q3, but you know, this is because of printing and all stuff. Why you don't never I even say that if I don't know the date? It just makes me sound stupider. <laughs> well, people, flash it on the screen. People don't need to know. Um, but you can pre-order it now from their site or your lo possibly your local. I think game it was store. only fifteen bucks, right? For no, the, it's like oh, twenty-five. Really? Oh, it must have been an ad for something else. Yeah. Oh, twenty-five is still not that. I much. mean, that, remember that's for the big box. That's for, I think each nightmare packs like four. Like they're not too, but this is also comes a box and dividers that look nice yeah. and usually. This kind of stuff you only get if you go to the like Arkham exclusive, right? Like, like, a, like the kind or like a event giveaway or something. Yeah. yeah. So to me, I think that seems pretty nice. Uh, I've got some bonus Fantasy Flight LCG news Ooh. for you. Bonus news! <laughs> they also have announced a new Star Wars LCG pack, Force mm -hmm. pack, set in based on the uh, what is it called? Rebels, the Rebels series. This is the, where they are at now. It's the final one. They are completing the Star Wars LCG line. No more packs are going to be released for it. So there are now all those sets exist, and they're stopping it. I don't know if um, they plan ever to relaunch it or wake it up, but that's kind of I actually think they are. Oh, really? I think hype is, I mean, I could be wrong. This is me putting on... You very well put, Everyone be. put on your tinfoil hats. Yeah. <laughs> Speculation. I think they're going the path of Call of Cthulhu. They made the last Call of Cthulhu pack, they stopped making it, and then the Arkham Horror card game came out, which mm. is a cooperative version. Mm. I think they're going to do that with Star Wars, because I think a cooperative Star Wars LCG game sound. Mm. I mean, does that not sound like... I know, I had been reading... Apparently there was an initial version of that card game that was cooperative, and they changed it. I think one of the things was some people said it felt too close to Lord of the Rings, uh, and they wanted to differentiate it. Uh, but it does seem like even though they have produced many Star Wars sets, so clearly people are playing it, it does seem like it's the least popular of all their LCGs, at least, at least in our, from what we've experienced right. and heard. Right, well, and I think another reason why making a cooperative version would be good is we have X-Wing, Armada, and right. the new Dice Mask, no, not Dice Destiny. Master, Destiny. <laughs> all these are competitive. Yeah, you are right. This cooperative would be different. It'd be more like the RPGs, but this has the card game. Imperial Assault's really the only And I do feel thing. the Lord of the Rings and Arkham Horror are very well received. Mm -hmm. And I do think you could... Uh, Arkham has shown you could do something different that's still cooperative. Yeah. So that's your bonus news. Mm -hmm. Look out for the uh, Star Wars the final LCG pack. That's kind of cool. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll buy them all now that it's over. All right. Uh, and you mentioned Dice Masters. I did. Great incidental segue. <laughs> because we got one final thing about Dice Masters, which is a CCG. They have announced something I'm very excited about. WizKids is going to be changing the way that they release and package Dice Masters games. Uh, it, originally, the way it's, they've been doing it is starter sets and booster packs, mm -hmm. just like your standard CCG, basically. They're doing away with that. They, it looks like permanently now, they're going forward with what they're calling campaign boxes. The first two, there's one for Warhammer and one for Marvel uh, that are, they're going to be starting with. And they're not going to have blind buy packs anymore. It's going to be a box. It's going to have 48 heroes in it. And included in the box will have all the dice that you need. So whatever the max dice is for that character, it's going to be in there. You won't need to hunt for them. You're going to have what you need for tournament play, the most you can do with that card, as soon as you buy one set. Uh, I thought this was really great. One of the things, we were always, we're always championing the uh, LCG format over the CCG format, over randomized packs, because it just seems like a, so much easier and less of a headache for everybody. Uh, 
I, it's interesting because usually I think Wiz Kids. I thought they were doing pretty well with this format, but uh, I don't know. What do you think about think how that change will impact the game or people or fans? Well, I don't know how it impact the game because I haven't been keeping up to date with like the tournament scene or anything like sure, that. Sure, I'm sure the metas. But I definitely think, first of all, Star Wars Destiny came into the scene, so they had really a rival in terms of the random packs, hmm. and the Destiny ones are, do feel nice. Those nice, the bigger they dice, got bigger and, dice, and with Star Wars <laughs> attached to it, and I. Do I mean, I don't know if this is connected. I'm really curious. Honestly, I'm surprised I haven't seen too many people talk about it. But just the idea, in general, of randomness being bought in nerd culture is becoming... Mm. I think it's... We're, we're all starting to be like, no, we're sick of it. I think uh, EA sort of finally pushed it too far that all of us are starting to... The, uh, the loot box crisis yes. in video games you're referring to. And I'm surprised no one... I'm curious if maybe you guys have heard. No one has brought up, like... When I've seen no one's been like, yeah, magic has been... Do like... No one's yelled at Magic for doing their, right. which is a loot box. No, I've even I have seen like Hearthstone have people are kind of getting sick of how much money you have to spend on it at this point, but yeah, not not Magic. No, they're immune to it. <laughs> right, and, and we've been bringing it up, and partly because we've mentioned how doing a anything that's a CCG, which is the loot box system, is almost you you shouldn't go in that market. You're gonna fail long term because nine times out of ten. The people you want are already in another CCG, and they're not like, I've already invested yeah. so much into Magic, or Yu-Gi-Oh!, or Pokemon. It's so hard to go into the other one. And for people like us, you know, I think it's so great f who, we just don't have the time, we, we have to play so many other games, we can't put our energy into a CCG like that, but we both liked Dice Masters a lot. Right. So now to be able to get a box. Well, and it also gets even more annoying when you're like, you're building your deck, let's say, and you're like, all oh, right, yeah. you know this would be great? This card. Oh, guess what? That card costs sixty dollars per card right. and eighty dollars per die. And it's even harder than even magic because you also do need that the dice in addition. So you got even if you get the card. Well, you, you might need multiple cards in magic. That's so true. Sort of that's true. But, but yeah. that, just the idea of needing multiple in the single market when the LCG ECG I think is the non copy. <laughs> yeah, expandable. Is I think we're going to see that a lot more, and definitely in the uh, card game industry, because I don't know if the loot boxing is going to actually hit board games, I th I think it might. I'd like to see that because, like we've said, I do think maybe it's because Magic's so old it'll be approved and allowed mm. because it, like they were first on the scene, so it's like, and everyone's yeah. already invested in them. But I do think we really, as a community, need to stop allowing the randomness for both the video and digital. I think there's so much out there I think it's we we can't handle that anymore. I yeah I agree. I think we're I think we are starting to head in that direction. Uh, so we'll see. We'll yeah. See. <laughs> so anyway, at least Dice Masters will have that format soon. So look for that. Maybe we'll play some more of it. I would love it if Star Wars Destiny followed suit because I really like that game too. No, uh, both both were great. I just, just don't like buying these <laughs> these packs. <laughs> All right. So that's our big news so far from 2018. Uh, we also have some few Kickstarter picks. Yeah. Of course, we I think we missed a bunch like in the last month. We just got a few to highlight Sorry. for you today. Uh, so if you didn't know what to buy, well, we saved you some money. Uh, First up, this is one that I looked at too that you're going to talk to us about. It is kind of, it's multiple games actually. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the Tokyo series, and there are three titles that are something like uh, Jido Hanbaiki, mm -hmm. Metro, that one I know, and Jutaku. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's funny, I'm really glad you said that because. I asked my brother, who actually knows Japanese, to pronounce them for me, and I forgot. So <laughs> now we can blame you for the mispronunciation. So what it made me... Th in essence, do you remember 504? I do. It's like that. Each game is, has actually a bunch of little games in them uh, that you can play, but they're, by their names, they're based. Like, one's actually... Metro, you could probably guess, is the Japanese metro system. It has to do with all the subway uh, tracks and stuff. Okay. One, I forget which is which, but is actually based on all the... You know, the uh, idea of all the uh, vending machines and stuff mm -hmm, all around. Mm -hmm. And the last one's actually based on the architecture in Japan of uh, trying to, how a lot of them can look really weird because they're trying to fit in weird spots and stuff. Yeah, and I know in the video, like, they're, like the vending, they actually have little 3D vending yeah, machines. Yeah, and <laughs> each game actually comes with a bunch of little games in it. But what's interesting is that if you have, like, the Metro and one of the other ones, which I'm not going to try to mispronounce, mm -hmm. you can actually get more games then because you have more pieces that you can combine. 
So it sort of has the 504 idea, but instead it's split up, which I thought was interesting. So you can sort mm -hmm. of get one, and if you really like that, then get another. You're not buying all of them at once. Yeah, I really, I really thought the art style looked cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, it almost looks kind of like minimalist, like it's very clean and a Japanese kind of uh, like modern technology art style kind of a look. Uh, I do, the multiple games thing does worry me a little. It does, but I think that by separating it out, and not, these three are the first in a full set, so there's more to come. It is cool that they're all from like different designers of other games, like mm -hmm. they got people to come in and teams. Uh, but you know, I know sometimes like it can be quantity over quality, but it, it, they're not doing like 504 where there well, were 504. Well, and that's why I like it's separated. So you can sort of, instead of just jumping deep into the pool with all the pieces, you can sort of wade yeah. in. And I know some of them, they have like dexterity games. And even then, it's still pretty pricey, I think. They're all kinds of genres. Uh, for in terms of pricing, I can I can cover yes. you there. Uh, it depends what you want. I think one of the, just, just one just was 35. One. Right. Uh, I mean, like you said, these are like three print bottles and like the architecture ones, these nice little wooden pieces. If you want all three, it's 99 bucks, which mm -hmm. isn't really that bad. For three games, if they're good quality, that's pretty good for a board game, I think. But I definitely think. a cool concept worth checking out. Yeah. And like you said, definitely visually very appealing. So check that out, Tokyo series, if you're a Japan fan. Uh, next up... Let's go into outer space with my good friend, John Carter of Mars. Oh, yeah. This is a, the role-playing game from Modiphius. Uh, John Carter, of course, failed film based on beloved uh, critical book franchise. That's what this is based in. Nothing to do with the movie. Uh, my reaction to this was, at first, I can't believe it. there hasn't... Maybe there was an older one, but it seems like that's something that should have been already in existence because this series has been around for so long. I actually have read uh, The Princess of Mars, which is like the big one that the, I think the movie was based on, which is really cool. If you don't know John Carter of Mars, it's like Star Wars, Dune, and many other sci-fi things really owe a lot to this story for establishing that kind of stuff. It's about a dude from Earth who goes to Mars, and it's kind of a Conan the Barbarian thing almost. He goes around, he meets aliens, he saves people, that kind of a deal. High fantasy, sci-fi adventure. And it's just a really cool setting, I think, for an RPG. From the sounds of it, they've done the work and the research, basing it in the stories. Uh, it's using a system that's been used in a few other games, including, I know, the recent Star Trek RPG. Slightly modified, where I don't know the exact details, but you have different skills that are supposed to make your skill roles easier to understand what your character can and can't do. Uh, I think somewhat streamlined, uh, not just kind of a, sim a rolling 1 through 20, but sort of a different take on that. And the character sheets and the art all look really cool in the, in the style of, of the series. So it sounds like a neat one. It sounds like they're putting a lot of work into it, for sure, if you like that uh, series. The only maybe hurdle for it is that, like the movie that came out, so many things have kind of done what this originated that there might be a lot of people who it doesn't seem as fresh now because we've seen it every other place in existence. True, <laughs> but I think there's one of those things that if you're a fan of the genre or even just the series itself, it's it's nice to see it. I mean, I really do love all the uh, these copyright RPGs coming out because it lets you be in the world that you know so many of us have already spent probably hours on thinking about. Yeah, and it, does, it has a lot of options for the races you can be, different time periods from the books. Uh, you, there is going to be an option just for someone to play as John Carter, or he can be an NPC or something like that. Now, do you think the movie was just someone's really bad own <laughs> RPG? Of? Could be. I actually like the movie, though. I, I didn't see good. it, so I <laughs> neither. But it bombed. Uh, so that is 20 bucks for the PDF. 54 gets you a hardcover copy, and there's like miniatures that you can pay different prices for involved as well. Uh, one more, speaking of miniatures, mm -hmm. some uh, accessory stuff, Jungle Fever, <laughs> resin cast, and scenery. Yeah, this is just a cool one I wanted to throw out to more of the miniature people. This, uh, if you wanted to make it look more of an Aztec theme, uh, that's a lot of pe uh, temples, walls, and stuff. And I think that's really cool. It's definitely a theme. I think it always looks really nice and fun to visit. Uh, like whether, Uncharted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that, if you're doing it for your, whether your own RPG, like your Dungeon Dragons table or your own Mitchers game, just something I thought cool to take a look at. Yeah, so check that out. Prices for that one vary all over the place because you can mix and match. Yeah. There's dice towers, I know. They had all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. going on for that. All right, so that's Kickstarter. Um, how about a little bit of viewer mail? All right, let's... Sounds fun, right? I'm sorry, the Meeple Gallery. Yes. <laughs> it's been a long time. 
Uh, so our last video before this one was, of course, our top 10 board games of 2017. If you missed that, definitely go check it out because there's some really great recommendations there. And people had reactions. Some strong, some not as strong. Uh, Rico Cordova says he hadn't played any of the games we talked about. <laughs> but he did really want to play Dinosaur Island. Uh, that one, I will say, like, because yeah. I got that, like, a week or two before. So that one was, like, that really... just made, made the, the cut. cut. <laughs> uh, he does uh, have Gloomhaven and, and is uh, really into it and says it has completely replaced Descent for him. Uh, and he's not sure if he's sold in Seventh Continent yet, but he made his own top ten list. You can, you can look at that if you care. You probably mm -hmm. don't. Uh, Michael Rodriguez said, I love Spirit Island, which was on both of our lists. Uh, it is very thinky, which was one of, one of my uh, uh, complaints. It's not really a complaint. But the conversations during gameplay were so awesome. The moments with the slow powers and hoping everything works out were so memorable. Great game. We both agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Stenock wasn't pleased with our list. Ooh. Thought there were too many party games for his taste. Which uh, we did, I, we did kind of, I think we had a good mix, honestly. Really? Yeah, I'm a, I, I guess for me right now, my top, I'm pretty sure, were all heavy, weren't they? I think I had, mine was like, honestly, like 50-50 heavy and party games. I think like maybe the first three, or the 10 through probably six for me were more. And I think, I think the just more, most heavy gamers would just have 10 heavy games. And that's, right. why, that's why. But we, we really like both. We like the lighter games. Um, and then Kenrick Fearn said, hurrah. <laughs> Finally, a top ten list where Gloomhaven is not number one. Well, <laughs> hold on. Can a game really be so good it's number one on everybody's top ten? I think not. <laughs> I don't know. We, as we said in that video, we weren't we didn't we weren't trying to hide it. We hadn't played Gloomhaven yet. That's why it wasn't on either of our list. There's a great chance it would have been maybe number one. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know because Seven of the Continent is so great. No, I mean we. I loved it. I mean, it's still you're still playing it. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely one I want to finish going through all the stuff. But there is something, you know, sometimes there is that cult of the new hype game that even Scythe, I think, to an extent, uh, was a part of the year it came no, out. A lot of things do that. And, uh, and maybe even Seventh Continent. I, I, you know. No, everything has it. I don't think I've, at least for me, I tend to be, I feel, in agreement with board games usually. What do you mean? <laughs> but compared to other things, like I know movies, I definitely. I'm not. You don't usually, side with the majority opinion. Yeah, know? I feel like I have my number one's usually way weird. I know <laughs> for yours, your number one movie for 2017 is one that you think you either love it or you hate it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely it, it can happen sometimes, but yeah, it, it, board games are are we've talked about this. It's interesting. I feel like they're much more objective. Like it's. There's, there's not as much. Usually it either plays well or it doesn't. Usually your preferences and whether it's bad or good is more just your own tastes of what kind of game you like. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why you tend to see a lot more similarities between people's lists. Right, and odds are a lot of the more people posting lists, I think, uh, are going to be lean toward more towards the heavy gaming yeah, because we like games, and usually if you like games, you like the heavy stuff. Yeah. So you're probably going to see more of those in the party games hitting the top ten lists. Yeah. Going back to the comment from before. <laughs> so uh, check out that video. Uh, leave a comment. We'll, we can check it out on the show later on. Let's get into a few games to wrap up our show that we have been playing lately. Starting with Hardback. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had an interview with the creators of this game on our channel. You can check that out. And Hardback is sort of the sequel to Paperback, which is a deck building, word making game uh, from Tim Fowers Games. New one uh, designed by Jeff Beck and Tim Fowers. And like we said, it's a deck building game, but the cards are all letters. And every turn, time it's your turn, you have to make a letter with your a word <laughs> with your hands, just one letter, um, uh, which is how paperback work. This one has a few interesting differences. Yeah. First off, you can choose to put a card face down and use it as a wild. Yep. In addition, instead of the cards really have the other one had a, each card was separate and they just had random abilities. This one has some abilities, but really they focus really on points or money. That's that's mostly it. The other abilities are actually attached to a genre. There are four genres. There is uh, romance, adventure, horror, and mystery. And these cards will actually play. So if you get a lot of mystery cards, they'll do a bunch of stuff. Because you so yeah, like a lot of deck building games, mm -hmm. they trigger off of each other. So if you have at least two in the lineup, then they'll work just one by itself, won't use its special power. There also are legacy uh, They're called like classic. Classic. And pretty literary much. Literary classics. They stay out in front of you. So you might get a chance to use them again. 
for their abilities. So just, and if you played any deck building game, anything that stays out is usually pretty good. However, your opponents can use them too, which yes. can be... And then the other thing is ink. There's a, there's a lot of new stuff yeah. in this game. Ink is so... In paperback, there were cards that would let you draw extra cards if you wanted to to make a better. Yeah, work. those are like the you wanted those cards when they came out. Those don't exist in this game. The only way to draw more is to purchase ink for one cent per turn or mm -hmm. per ink on your turn, and each for each ink you use, you get to draw a card. But that letter you draw, you have to use that in your word. Uh, so it's a press your luck thing, where if you want to get more points and a bigger word, you've got to hope you're getting letters that you can use. Right, and there is some ways to get around it, but we won't get into that nitty gritty part. But overall, this, comparing to paperback, uh, hardback really focuses more on, because you can do wilds and stuff, I think it's really about making much bigger words, I felt. Like we were really focusing more on your own words. When in paperback, there are a lot more drawing, attacking your opponent. So it was really just throwing them out like that. Really, you got to take advantage of that ink system in this one. Yeah, it really is. That ink is the big differentiator uh, because it does, it kind of turns it into a push your luck game, which is a very different take on it. And not only that, because you can get more cards to draw, a lot of it isn't just, oh, I'm going to buy an A or an E. You're going to be like, I could get the E, but that F is in the adventure genre, which I have a bunch of cards for. Yes. When, and we noticed that, and it became really fun. It, like, if you played any of the other games, you get that engine going of like, uh, and, leg and legendary Spider-Man, and like getting a lot of Spider-Man cards or something, getting a lot of horror. Well, you and I both did. Yeah. Turned <laughs> very well in our favor. We were. It allowed us to make some very big words. <laughs> yeah, we had some uh, fun back and forth that way. I, I was surprised. Uh, you know, was, I knew this was a sequel to Paperback. How different it actually felt. You know, originally I was thinking this probably will just replace Paperback straight up. After playing it, I'm like. No, actually, it's pretty different. They both can kind of stand on their own, even though they're both making words. They feel... Uh, the, right. This one has so many different no, systems. Exactly, because even though you have the group, the four groups, their special abilities, it was like horror let you get something called Whiteout. Uh, the legendary was more about points. Uh, the hor uh, Not the horror. The uh, romance was like doubling nearby cards and the uh, investigation let you Mystery use let you like flip wilds yeah. to use them for their points. So it wasn't really like... It was really focusing on you trying to make a big turn for yourself. When I felt like paperback was more of a uh, definitely more player interaction and more of an on guard. Like I'm gonna buy out this pile so you can't get it, and then use this attack word to make you discard a vowel or something. Mm -hmm, when this mm -hmm. is like, no, you're going all in to make an eleven letter word. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Floundering, I think, was your word? <laughs> My last word was floundering, yeah. Yes. 11 letters, it was great. Yeah, and there's a bunch of variants that we haven't experimented mm -hmm. with yet, like the different events and player powers that we definitely want to try, and a co-op mode. Uh, so lots of cool stuff. Uh, I'm sure the this was a Kickstarter, which I think is going to be going out to people pretty soon, and then they see sells all his game on Tim Fowers' site. Uh, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to find it at some point. I Yeah, definitely this is a great one for if you're a big war fan because of since it focuses more on making sure you do your own turns, they, you don't have to feel like you're getting punished by other players. You can be like, I know I, I have a, another E in there, another D somewhere of this genre, which is going to just let me make this crazy word. Yeah, do you think you have a preference between the two yet? Or maybe um, we've only played this one once. So. Honestly, it's, I want to play the modes more, because that's really the, cause both of them have a lot of extra little things in there. Yeah. And it depends on the mood, because like I said, this is more uh, greater for bigger words than the people I'm playing with. The other one... It's sort of fun to be able to attack, play an attack card, or draw two. Yeah. yeah. So it's definitely a preference. Yeah. I'm with you there. Room for both. Uh, so that's hardback. Uh, we also played... Oh, oh make nope. sure you we have an up-to-date dictionary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's important. We were using the 1997 dictionary. Sometimes words weren't in there. <laughs> that are words. <laughs> But that's neither here nor there. Uh, one of the next game that we played was Alien Artifacts mm -hmm. uh, from Portal. This is a it's basically a 4X card game where you are all in charge of one alien race, and on your turn you are buying up three different types of cards: planets, technology, and ships. ships. <laughs> and once you have bought them, you can then on your turn develop them, and you can choose. There's double-sided, so depending on how you develop them, different effects can occur. Right. So for ships, the, usually the one side really helps with playing more, re being able to play more cards to build other cards. So it sort of a uh, lets you gives you more variety, build up of cards. Mm -hmm. And the other side, though, is focusing more on attacking. 
for technology. One is for maybe an instant effect of like getting more better goods on trade deals and stuff on the other side's points. So it's short versus long game. And finally, planets, same thing. It's the either a discount on everything or just more cards. Yeah, resource cards. generation. Uh, and that's basically, everything works from drawing these resource cards, that's your hand, which are also uh, have a top and a bottom, and you can choose which half you're using, which type of resource you want to spend. So uh, kind of like something like Imperial Settlers had or 51st State where every card has multiple functions, almost everything in this game is you have a choice to make about it, which, mm -hmm. I, which I love. Uh, and we, we I, I had done the demo version at Gen Con. This is the first time we really sat down and did a full game. Well, this, yeah, and this is the first time me seeing it. So. Yeah, and we did a full five-player game. Uh, it, it, it took a while. It took a while to wrap our heads around all the possible actions you can do because there's so many choices. But I thought once we got into it, it people's turns moved fairly quickly. Yeah, they actually, once you understood how really what worked and what you had in your hand and maybe how cards interact, you'd have a general a path to go. I think everyone knew what they're doing then. And what was really fun is it's one of those games where, at least definitely with the cards I saw, mm -hmm. it'd be like, I got this blue card, which tells me I make plants cheaper by getting more ships. All right, now I gotta get more ships, therefore it gets more plants. By getting these planets, I'm gonna make my tech te cheaper. Yeah. So it's sort of <laughs> this snowball, you make this snowball engine effect. It's a real, It's an engine building game for sure. I think the one thing we all learned is that none of us really knew how to play, <laughs> like in terms of what strategizing. No, it, everybody kind of felt like, oh, if we played this again, I would do this from but the beginning. I think it was in a good way though. I think some games yeah. are like, Oh, well, that's the winning strategy, so if we all know. But we didn't feel like that. We felt like, okay, I yeah. know how synergy is supposed to work in this game, so I know, like, maybe I should invest in this a bit more early and then this. We had some, it was very interesting to hear people's different takes about, oh, I should have gone into, like, attacking clearly seems like the way to go, and then, like, no, it actually seems like you know, tech, It was really. also really funny how each person, I think someone else was like, that person's gonna win. We're, we, why are you even giving up? And of course, it was like, no, you're gonna win. And then yeah, it was actually I. That was another interesting thing because most of your points, at least the way we played, but I think in general, most of your points don't really show up on the scoreboard until the end. So unless you're really paying attention to people's cards and strategies, it's hard to judge who's in the lead. Uh, you can, but it's not immediately obvious, like some games. So it, the points from, for me didn't end up really at all where I thought they were the spread of which place was in where, uh, but, which was cool. Yeah, and one of the things I did love is because, I mean, it was one. Of the, it's also one of those games too when you're always like, if I had one more turn to play the card because you to get that engine going. But because you, you yeah. can attack other people, we didn't do too much, but I guess the way we saw it, unless someone really goes snowball attacking, it really does feel like you're gonna have fun building your engine, which is always, because I always wanna come back and be like, all right, how can I get one extra, squeeze out one extra turn or something and get, build this. Yeah, it didn't feel uh, nearly, I'm gonna compare it again to Imperial Settlers. They're from the same company. I feel like they're kind of in the same genre-ish where that game is a lot meaner, I think, and attacking people can provide greater benefits because you can outright destroy someone's oh, card. Oh yeah, no, like, I know there are some games we've played You can where get salty. <laughs> In this game, it wasn't, the attacking was definitely, could be worthwhile in the right situation, but it didn't feel like, oh man, I lost because he attacked me or whatever. Right. You're not going to lose your best stuff. It was a, a little gentler. It's definitely one where you want to play again. Um, also, heads up, you've heard that there is an infinite combo somewhere in this game. <laughs> yeah, if you're on Board Game Geek, I don't know the details, but apparently people discovered a, uh, <laughs> an infinite loop that can be created uh, through some combination of, I think it was a, an attack and defense plan combo, which uh, is usually never good. I don't know if it's actually like advantageous to do it. I don't know if like it's like an overpowered thing, but it it's depends. Because it, like interesting in, in magic, if you hit infinite loop, it, it ends a stalling the game, which you lose if you're <laughs> stalling it, or b infinite damage or something, and you just you, you killed your enemies. Yeah, so uh, look out for that. Be, I'm, I'm guessing there was probably an errata for that coming right. down the road. But ride. definitely a lot of fun. I can definitely see this game having expansions. Oh, yeah. Definitely I think recurs. there already is one, <laughs> or at least announced. But that would fit well with, like, some yeah. games you're like, I don't need any more, but I can, some fun tech cards to just switch it up so you don't always see the same thing. Yeah, there's a lot of variations of different routes you can go, which is great. And another thing you mentioned, once again, going back to Imperial Settlers, I think. When you get a group, in Imperial Settlers, you're really like, once you get that group, you're like, this is where I'm going. At least for mm. my group, I didn't feel that Your way. faction. My mean, faction. Basically. Yeah. Like, yeah they, I didn't feel like I have to go this way or because I only produce this anyway. Yeah, the factions do have a unique ability, which is just a different 
way you spend to get a special card. Mm -hmm. But really, they don't feel like some games where, th 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 for the most part, you're all in an equal playing but field. But I know my, I like, I didn't read your guys' abilities. I know mine was just getting a variety of different cards, so I didn't feel I was really tied down. Yeah, like to mine was, only military. Help was rewarded me more points for getting planets and stuff, but. Everybody wants planets. Right, so, you ended uh, up with a lot of everything usually, so... You're, it doesn't, like, really skew your strategy, which is, yeah, I think that is something to be yeah, said about that. Definitely a lot of fun, worth checking out. Finally, last game that we played uh, recently is Cthulhu Tales. Yes. Uh, picked this up at uh, PAX Unplugged, I, I did. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we finally got to do it. Uh, with, with the full five people. Mm. Uh, in this game, you are all trying to pretty much convince that you are not crazy and you should be the one left out of the uh, asylum. And it takes place, of course, in the world of Lovecraft. Uh -huh. So that's going to come into play. <laughs> you are going to be given a bunch of story cards, and pretty much you have to explain with these story cards what happened in a very sane sense. Like you, And it's very interpretational. So you can get a card that says, half-eaten body. Now you know that's probably something that's a little weird to talk about. Like for instance, one of my cards was Oblivion. <laughs> it you know it had a guy going insane. I used it as the video game Oblivion just because why not? So you can do whatever. So you, you want. have to be like it, try to explain the way like oh I found this body it was a, a murder suspect or something. But other people are gonna have cards called madness cards, pretty much really weird twisted things. Be like well and. I heard that you had you're talking about Cthulhu or something. Yeah, and then you you may have to explain that away as part of your story. It's, you're, you're defending yourself. Yes, kind of. really. And in the end, depending on whether you do are able to explain away or not in the story, you're gonna get treat, these little treatment tokens. And at the end, depending on how many treatment tokens you have, you compare to everyone else, one person gets to leave. Uh, it really is a game that really is just about telling the story. It's not. I mean, yes, there's a point in the winner, but it, a lot of fun was just. Well, what about those weird bodies you've been keeping in your basement? Yeah, it's definitely a storytelling game. It's it's not one to play if you are really into some strategy. Uh, but if you have a funny group that likes Lovecraft and weird stories, there's a lot of funny stuff. And there is a little strategy because certain yeah. nightmare cards can be played depending on the combo of cards on the field. So you could be like, if I play this card, then it's going to be really hard for them to play Nightmare. Right, you have to match the color. So you can, depending on your hand, strategize a little bit, and then maybe that won't work with your story, so you have to improvise. But overall, the best part wasn't really the strategy. It was coming up, especially when you had a, when some of those bad cards. You're like, well, yes, that's a... Uh, well, you see, I was talking about Oblivion. The video game, like, we had right, some really right. weird, like, U-turns, and, like, yeah. it's really... It's definitely great for or improv practice and stuff. I think my only complaint with it is... And uh, this may also just be... I think I might have a better sense if... I sat down and really read the rule book, and maybe we like got no, a the rules sense were, of it. I, I'm going to say, going through the rules, they're yeah. definitely not placed the right way, I feel. I feel like this section should have been here. Not Yeah, my, my issue was, it, it, I wish it were clearer exactly how you were supposed to be arguing. It was sort of vague about, you're I defending yeah. your position, uh, so am I, like... T am I talking? I'm talking to my inmate, but I'm also being. I'm defending I should, against the warden. I didn't read warden. as many examples because I want to get to the gameplay. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I don't. I don't really blame you. I just. I think it's. It's different from some games where you're ju like gloom. You're just saying what happened to the person. It's very right. straightforward. This one is a little. I, I think it would really help to get someone who has experience with the game to explain it uh, or watch a video. Just. I think for first-time players, it's kind of. It's a different sort of thing right. to wrap your head around. But definitely a very fun. If you just want to tell some really weird stories. And cool art, of course, yeah. like all these Cthulhu games tend to have. Uh, so that's Cthulhu Tales. Uh, those are all the games that we played. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the end of this Roll for Crit podcast. I do want to leave something off the, the, for people to answer in the comment section. Yep. Uh, another game I'm not going to talk too much because we have been playing. I've been playing a bit more, though. I think I, we talked about already was Legend of the Five Rings. And I'm curious how you guys feel about the clans, especially since packs have come out now. Uh, I currently have not won a single game. My friend's deck is undefeated. I'm not going to say which groups, so no one can say, so there's no bias towards one group or another. But I'm curious on your opinion, if there is one group you think that shines more, maybe it's just like this group better, uh, hurts more people if they're beginners to the game, but then if you're experienced, it's not. I'd definitely love to hear you guys' opinions about that. Let us know. Of course, the place to do that is right down below in our comments section on YouTube, where you can also like and subscribe to this channel. 
Uh, you don't want to miss all the cool changes that we've got coming in 2018. Lots of awesome stuff. If you, I mean, if you've watched this entire video and you're not subscribed, why wouldn't you subscribe? <laughs> Clearly, you liked something, right? But of course, there's so many other places to get to us: Twitter, mm -hmm. at Roll for Crit, yeah. Instagram, Facebook. We're yeah. everywhere. Yeah, we're in so many places. Check them all out in the links. Still in 2017. And uh, our website, rollforcrit.com, where at least for the time being, we have many games that are at discounted, big old prices mm -hmm. that are good. Small prices, I mean, not big ones. And uh, plus more links to all of our videos, of course, and all that stuff. So you want to check that out. Uh, so thanks for watching so much. I'm Jonathan Estes. I'm Will Keeler. And this has been Roll for Crit.